thanks thanks everyone i appreciate you being here i know it's like a very long talk and there are uh, a bunch of other great talks coming on right now so if you feel like um, leaving at a certain point to watch a talk and coming back, that's totally fine. This is our agenda today. Uh, so we are going to start with search, uh, Atlas Search, which is based on Lucene. Uh, it's kind of a basic introduction uh, to MongoDB and uh, to Atlas Search. So if you're already an, a search expert, uh, this might be uh, a bit basic for you, but you'll still get a refresher on Lucene. And the second part, which starts at around 10, 10. I'll try to stick to this schedule in case someone wants to join after the first talk. Uh, it's going to be GraphQL. Uh, how many of you are here because of GraphQL? Yeah, that's, that's what I thought. Um, perfect. Uh, the other important part about this presentation is that it's very hands-on. So if you feel like uh, following the tutorial while I'm presenting, you can totally do that uh, using your own laptop or um, just on your phone uh, looking at the agenda and following the topics there. Uh, I get super distracted when I watch someone on stage and I need to have something to play with. <laughs> so I, I would totally understand if you're on your phones uh, like doing different stuff. You, don't worry, I won't be offended. This is the workshop itself. Uh, it's also fully offline. Uh, you can do it later. Uh, it's, it doesn't require any... There is no pay gate. Uh, you can register for Atlas uh, without using any credit card. You can just uh, provide your email, register, and follow the steps there. All right, let's, let's get started with a short intro about MongoDB. I'm sure the people who are leaving are going to come back later. <laughs> The thing that we are going to be using the most today, besides Apache Lucene, is the MongoDB document model and the query API. The query API is the API, uh, which is not exactly a language, but the API that we're using to query documents to uh, query the database. So kind of like the SQL that people use uh, to query a, a, a relational database. So what is the deal with these documents? Documents are really a superset over any other model that people use when they uh, model their data in a database. So you can model relational uh, connections there as well using documents. You can have foreign keys and uh, make references to other documents. So this is possible. Uh, you can model graph data. Of course, if you have very heavily interconnected data, um, like um, I don't know, social media is an example that people give when they talk about graph connections. You might want to use a dedicated uh, database, but like, that's a very rare case. You can definitely model graph data using a document database as well. And you can model time series as well, uh, time series data with sensor data that you get every, um, every milliseconds, every 100 milliseconds data from sensors. and. Uh, put that in buckets inside documents, and even archive that uh, using a TTL. So documents are quite universal. When people say a document database, uh, and they say a NoSQL database, uh, they don't really usually realize that documents can be used to model all sorts of data. Uh, and this is maybe for historical reasons, because people used uh, document databases to just put any sort of JSON object there, uh, unstructured data, and not really use it as a database. Uh, but that's not really the case. So let's take a look at the uh, documents that we will be using today in this workshop. So here, this is um, a program called MongoDB Compass. It's a graphical user interface that you can use to connect to your um, database cluster, MongoDB database cluster. I have already connected to uh, the production cluster that we will be using today. So on the right, we see the databases in this cluster. Uh, we have some system ones like admin, config, local. And this is our actual data called soccer. I apologize in advance. Uh, this uh, workshop was prepared initially uh, by my colleague Karen. She lives in the US, and that's what they call football there. So, no, no. Uh, if I say soccer, you know what I'm talking about. We all know the proper name for the game. Uh, but yeah, so we have the football database, and we have players collection inside it. Just a single collection, so that we can focus our our efforts. 
And on the right, we see the documents. This is a sample of uh, all the 19,000 documents uh, in the collection. Uh, so if we take a look at one of the do these documents, uh, it looks like an object, any programming language object. Uh, and this is what documents in MongoDB look like. So we have different fields. The underscore ID is the primary key. Uh, the primary key. It uses a special type called uh, object ID. Uh, then we have, um, you can see we have strings, we have numbers. Uh, more importantly, we can have nested objects or sub-documents. This is actually not a very nested object, it's a special date type, uh, but you can have nested sub-documents if you want. Uh, you can have nested arrays, and this is all supported by, by design. So, of course, you can have um, sub-collections and stuff like that in some relational databases, uh, but this is not by design. So, um, these are features that were added later on. Uh, but with documents, uh, with any document database, you can have nested objects uh, and also arrays. You can see that this is a very large document. And one of our jobs today will be to uh, build an API that returns just a subset of all that data. Uh, you can argue that this is not a great um, model. Obviously, you don't want to store um, 200 fields in one single document. But we'll ignore that. We will just build our API uh, in such a way that uh, we return just the, the subset of data that we need for the application. All right, what else do we have here? So here we can query the database. Uh, so for example, I can query uh, using an exact match. So I can uh, get um, the player with the short name l.messi. This should return the first document I see here. And you see here that we have just one document. Now, if I misspell it or do any other mistake that doesn't match exactly, you see that we don't get any documents. This is an exact match. Uh, and in opposite of that, uh, today we will be using full text search. So in full text search, uh, this whole thing will be uh, broken into two separate tokens um, using the token um for keywords. Uh, and we will be able to also use fuzzy search. So if I just uh, use Messi, this should be able to find it because we are going to be using full text search as opposed to this exact match search that we see here. All right, back to the documents. So MongoDB Atlas uh, is the platform that I will be showing you today. It is built by MongoDB, the company. At its core is the uh, document database MongoDB, but it's a lot more than that. Uh, it has all sorts of services, uh, including Atlas Search, which is the full text search that I was mentioning. Uh, the whole idea is that you have integrate everything at the same place, and it's all integrated with your operational data. So what is Atos Search, um, and why is it important? Uh, in a study done by uh, Gartner, 87%, uh, they found that 87% of shoppers that open a website, uh, an e-commerce website, go right to the search bar. So this is the first thing that they use. They don't browse the website or go to a certain category. They go and search uh, using the search bar. And another study found that 68% of the people that don't find the result uh, in their first search query just leave the website. So the first experience of 87% uh, of shoppers is actually the search bar. And that's why search is super important uh, for modern applications. So why do we want to use Atos Search? In the past, people, our clients uh, at MongoDB were integrating their MongoDB database with existing services like Elastic uh, and so on, uh, and all of them use Apache Lucene. So we thought, why don't we bring this into the platform? So we just implemented um, Atos Search, which uses Apache Lucene under the hood. And the whole idea is that you have all the services, everything you need in the same place, integrated with the document model. So our goal today, uh, or something that we call uh, the, the search game, uh, will be to make sure that this search bar is, this isn't, okay, is as big as a goal net and 
everything that our users search for uh, is surely going to be a goal. It's not going to be a miss. So in order to do that, we need some players. Uh, the search game that um, we're going to play, uh, this is the application that we will use, actually. So uh, we want to make sure that everyone who visits the application finds whatever they, uh, they need, and uh, they leave us a, a good review, and they, they find the products that they need. So let me show you the application before I proceed. Um, this is a, a real application. It's, uh, the domain is Atlas Search Soccer. Uh, you probably don't see it, but it's literally atlasearchsoccer.com. Um, it allows you to, bre uh, to build your dream team. Uh, so if I select a position here and search for a player, I don't really know any forwards um, playing for the German team right now, but I can do that. <laughs> and search for Thomas Müller. And you saw here that they didn't use the umlaut, uh, but they were still able to find Müller uh, because they have fuzzy search. So even if this character is not the right one, uh, I was still able to find the right player. Um, I heard that this guy is uh, really good, Kai Havertz. I'm not sure how to spell his name, but yeah, we, we were able to find him. Uh, this is a data set from 2022, so you can see that some of the clubs might be different nowadays. Uh, but yeah, we have Kai Havertz, so I can build him here. Um, and uh, there is a lot more to this application. So we have text search, full text search, we have wildcard search. So if I search for um, Szczesny, I don't really know how to spell his name, uh, but if I use a star for like the wildcard and finish this with NY, I should be able to find him. Yeah, I managed to find him. Um, another cool thing is the autocomplete. So if I search for Ronaldo, um, I, I have the autocomplete search. And uh, here on the right, you actually see the query itself. So if I zoom in a little bit, you will see that this is um, actually the query that is being executed against uh, my database to find this player. If I go to advanced scouting, I have facet search. So facets are these categories that I can select and you see here that uh, I have now filters. The text should include France. Uh, I can filter by, uh, by a team as well, by position, and so on. So definitely, you can play with this uh, and um, see how to build these queries yourself. It's kind of a self-documented application. It's really cool. And I wanted to show you one more thing that we will actually build ourselves. Uh, so let's go back to text and search for Ronaldo. Ronaldo, as you know, is a very popular name uh, in the Latin world. So we see a bunch of Ronaldos here. But we actually want Cristiano Ronaldo. So how do we make this happen? Uh, how do we make sure that uh, the users find the most popular player? Well, you can uh, modify the scoring. So every single player here is scored based on the relevance of this text compared to their actual long name. We can use function score. And if I zoom in here, uh, we can add the relevance uh, to the overall. The overall is the actual um, score for this player, like uh, a score by FIFA from 1 to 100. So we have the overall. We add this to the relevance score. And now we actually get Cristiano Ronaldo first with the score of 93. And then the other people are sorted um, based on their overall score. All right, so this is our simple application. We will build uh, a bunch of these functionality today. Um, everything that I showed you uh, besides facets. Um, a random introduction in the middle about me. My name is Tanimira. I live in Bulgaria. I work for MongoDB. Um, I'm a developer advocate there. Uh, so my job is to come here, talk to you. And uh, actually, I would love to hear about your use cases as well after this talk. Uh, so you can find me and uh, network with me. If you can't find me, you can reach out to me or LinkedIn, Twitter, or whatever platform you use. Uh, I'm also a Google Developer Expert for Angular and the Coursera instructor. I have a couple of published um, courses on Coursera. Uh, 
I write some articles and yeah, I speak at conferences. I've been to Berlin many times, always for uh, conferences and I really love the city. How many of you here live in Berlin? All right, cool, cool, cool. I don't live here, but I enjoy the city a lot. All right, but let's go back to this documents thing. We saw the documents that we will use, but we need a couple more players on our team to make the search game successful. We loaded the data. I won't show you how to load this data, but if you follow the workshop, the link that they shared, uh, there is instructions how to load this data into your own cluster when you deploy it. Uh, I showed you the application as well. Um, this allows us to find players with weird names. Um, and how do we search actually using MongoDB Atlas? So we need the data, the database collection. Uh, we can create a search index for a collection. So the index is for a particular collection, not for the whole database. And then we can query using the door search operator. Door search operator is part of the query API that I mentioned, the language that we use to communicate with the MongoDB database. So let's build a search index. The support types for a search index are all of these types. Uh, today we will be using just text and numerical. Uh, we could honestly use just text, but I want numerical for the uh, function scoring. All right, so this is MongoDB Atlas. Uh, this is the cluster that I have deployed and I loaded the data into. Um, I can open the cluster and I will show that, yeah, this is the same data that we saw earlier. So in order to build a search index, I need to go to search over here and create a search index. Uh, I will use the visual editor. In the end of the day, uh, what is generated will be a JSON configuration anyway, but let's start with the visual editor. The index name, I'll keep it as a default because I don't have any other indexes in this cluster, and I will select the database and the collection. And that's the configuration, the default configuration that we have. Uh, so uh, the index analyzer that we have is Lucene standard. Uh, so it will break the player names or all the text in all fields into tokens uh, based on like the white space or commas. Uh, this is how it will generate tokens. Uh, we also have something called dynamic mapping. Now, the ma dynamic mapping is really cool if you're just getting started. It basically goes through all fields in the document, and it, um, it says this field is of this type, this field is of this type. It creates mappings for every single field. But it's kind of slow because uh, it will create mappings for all these 200 fields that we saw. So I don't want to uh, wanna do that, uh, even though it's very easy to get started with. I'm going to go and refine the index. I will disable the dynamic mapping, and I will add my own field mappings. And it's really simple to add them. Uh, so I want to map the short name of the player, uh, and this is of type string. I'll add that. Um, then I will also map the long name. This is kind of the full name of the player, Lionel, Andres, Messi, and, and so on, or for Ronaldo, maybe 10 names. Uh, I will also map the overall. And this now is actually a number. So I'm going to have to find a number. And I think this is enough for now. Um, you can create mappings for all the fields that you need. And of course, you can refine the indexes later as well, re-index your data. That's everything we need. Uh, you can see we support mappings as well. So if you need a multilingual search, um, you can create a mapping from English to Spanish, from English to German. Uh, let's save the changes and create the search index. We see that the build of the index is now in progress, and we will uh, receive an award. I will actually receive an email when it's built. I'm not sure why this is the default behavior, but yeah, every time I play with it, I get an email. Um, we can follow the status here. It should take up to a minute or, or so. So let's go back to our presentation while we wait. Again, all of these data types are supported. And in addition to them, uh, there is also support for facets. 
Again, faucets are a clever way to uh, put the data into different buckets based on some categories. So a category might be um, the position of the player or their club or their um, country. All right. So actually, the star player on our team today won't be Messi. Uh, it won't even be Mbappe. This is an old picture, like the cup is in the previous player's hands now, but anyway. Uh, the star player of our, of our uh, team today is Apache Lucene. And I'm sure if you were here yesterday, uh, you have heard about Lucene. And if you're at this conference, I'm sure you know about Lucene as well. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time uh, on it. It's uh, an open source Java library that every single um, search product, like most popular full text search products like Elasticsearch and Atlas Search, use under the hood. And what is really powerful about this is that we will be actually using uh, this uh, document database. Uh, we will be passing it uh, into the, the Apache Lucene analyzers, and we will generate some tokens. And these tokens then will be used to create an inverted index uh, that we will use to search for data. So what is this, the deal with this inverted index? Uh, the inverted index, if you think about it, is really every single token uh, points to a document. So if you break uh, l.messi into two, two tokens, you will have the, uh, in the index, you will have, in the inverted index, you will have l. dot pointing to the document uh, for Lionel Messi. You will have Messi pointing to the same document. And actually, every single player that has the l. dot token as part of their name will point to uh, the, all the documents that are relevant to this player. But how does this index, inverted index, uh, compare to the MongoDB index? So we have Atlas Search, which creates an inverted index, and MongoDB uh, uses B3 indexes. So how do they work together? So um, these are, this is a default MongoDB document, and by default, every MongoDB document has an index on the primary key, the underscore ID field. So if we have the Manchester United term, and we split it into tokens using the standard analyzer, we will have the Manchester and United tokens. Now the standard index will be this using the primary key. The inverted index will be built by, um, by Atlas Search uh, using the tokens. And now the tokens, uh, you can see that they point to documents one and two. So to Manchester United and Manchester City for the Manchester token. And United points to one and three, to Manchester United and Newcastle United, to these two documents. So this is how they compare. So actually, we will use both indexes when we are querying. Um, let me just elaborate a bit more on that. So when we send a query using the Manchester um, Manchester query, like as a text. Uh, first, we will go to the inverted index. Uh, we will find um, the one and two there, the value of the index. And then we will go to the standard index, and we will find the actual documents. And this is how, it's, how it works under the hood. These are all the analyzers that Lucene supports, and they're also supported uh, in uh, MongoDB Atlas. Uh, so for example, you can use the keyword analyzer as well uh, and uh, make sure that the whole string uh, stays together. And in this case, Manchester United will be just one token that points to the um, concrete document there. All right, I hope the index is already built and we will proceed with the last stage, uh, which is querying the data using the dollar search um, operator. Okay, we see that the uh, the index is now active. Uh, it has indexed all these documents, and we can start using it. Now, I will use MongoDB Compass again uh, because it's easier to build um, uh, queries there. So if I go to aggregations, 
I see again a sample of my documents. Uh, we see a bunch of documents, and I will create a new uh, a new query. So create new. Where's the stage? Okay. So in the query API, we build aggregation pipelines. A pipeline contains different stages. It's basically an array with different stages that we execute, and each stage transforms the data. This is really zoomed in, and yeah, that's why I don't see the stage. So I'm going to expand that. All right, so this is the input. Uh, this will be the modifier, the stage, and this will be the output. So the first stage will be our search. Do you see all right? OK. So in the door search stage, we need to specify the name of the index. The name was default. Uh, because it's default, I can just remove it. Uh, if it was something else, I should put the specific name. Uh, then I should provide the query. Uh, we're going to be looking for Messi and the path. The path will be short name. So when I do that, you see that we have one document matching. And if I search for l.messi, now I will get 10 documents. Uh, so I will have messi. I will also have l.bailey, um, l.pellegrini, and so on. So this matches the first token. Is that clear? All right. Let's keep just messy for now. And I will add one more stage to the aggregation pipeline after search. Uh, and I will use project. Project basically allows me to filter the fields that I need. So I can say I want just the short name, the quop name. Um, quop name? Yeah, quop name exists. And yeah, we have just messy and quop name. And I also want the overall score. You can see it's all data. He's no longer playing in PSG, but that's another topic. Don't want to get into it. Um, all right, let's go back to the first stage. Did I add a new stage? Oops, sorry. And see what happens if I make a mistake here, if, if I misspell Messi's name. I don't get any documents. But how do we fix that in full text search? I mentioned this a couple of times already. Anyone has any ideas? Fuzzy search, yeah, perfect. So let's implement fuzzy search. It's as simple as going here and saying fuzzy and then providing the maximum edits that we can make, so the maximum mistakes that we can make. And now we get eight documents. Let's go to the second stage um, and see which are the documents. So we have Mesa, Messi, Musi, <laughs> Meili, and again Mesa, a few more Mesas, Mei, Mei Funk. So we got the result that we kind of wanted. Uh, but let's see what is the score uh, of these documents. Why were they sorted in this way? Uh, to do that, I can use the, um, the meta document. So if I can create a new field called um, search relevant score, I don't think there, it matters what, what I call it. I think I messed up this syntax, so I will quickly go to the workshop. Uh, if you follow the workshop later, uh, you can you will go through exactly the same the same thing. So fuzzy matching. Right. Let's grab this real quick. So it's meta search score. All right, the search score, score that we see here um, is the reason why the results are sorted in this way. So we see the most relevant results first. So we see that Mesa and Messi have the same search score together with the other people uh, that have um, just one difference in their name. And May has a lower score. So this is 2.9, this is 2.6. Uh, because I guess it's a three-letter name. 
but again, how do we implement this relevant scoring? How do we use the overall uh, to make sure that we see Messi first? I need to go back to the search and amend it over here. So I'm not going to bore you with any more live coding. I will just grab this piece of code and tie it. Now I'll go to the other stage again. And now we have a score. So we had two point something before that. Now we have 95 because we are adding the overall field to the relevant score. And now we have the actual player that we want first. Uh, let's go through the syntax here. So we basically uh, in the same in the same index, uh, the same operator, uh, I added score and I am using a function to add these two fields to uh, sum them. I am adding the overall and the relevance. And this is how, how simple it is to modify the, uh, the score. I can also use multiply and it will have the same result. Uh, so now if I go to project, you see that the score is 270 because we're multiplying 90 by 2.3 or something like that. All right. So this is the search part. We are right on time. Uh, let's just finish off the, the auto search part and we can start with GraphQL. So what we did here to summarize is we built an aggregation pipeline. Again, an aggregation pipeline is um, a list of different stages and uh, each stage modifies the results the next stage gets the modified results, and in the end, we have an output document or a bunch of documents, or we can have just one, one number if we want. So we had uh, search as the first stage, uh, then we had um, project, and we can add as many of these as we want. This is the search query that we used. Uh, again, we used fuzzy search to make sure that we can find Messi if, even if we misspell his name. And we also use relevant scoring. So why is relevant scoring important? Because first of all, everyone uses it. And if you don't find your result uh, in the first search query that you, uh, that you provide, uh, you are very, unlike, uh, very likely to leave the page and never come back. So we can use function scoring. We can use also boost. And we can provide a certain constant. Uh, these are all coming again from Lucene. And they're all available in Atlas Search. We used function scoring because it's really easy to implement. Uh, we can also use boost. Boost allows you to uh, boost certain documents. For example, you can get uh, discounted products first, like see if the product is discounted, then boost the scoring. And everyone uses that. Like uh, it's, It feels like a hack because sometimes a certain e-commerce provider is first showing you their own products. And maybe this is not very ethical, but they, they do it. And if everyone is doing it, you should do it too, um, as long as it's ethical to your users. Now, a couple of performance uh, tips. Uh, don't use, um, so yeah, first, don't use dynamic analyzers where possible. Um, dynamic mapping, sorry. Use um, your own field mappings. Uh, you can improve your sp index space using custom analyzers. Uh, the second thing is don't use underscore um, dollar sort. This is a sorting stage that you can use in MongoDB, but it doesn't make sense to use that in Atlas because all of your results are already sorted basic, based on their relevant score. So optimize the relevant score instead of using sort. If you need to use match or sort for some reason, uh, you can actually use um, computed fields. Um, we call them stored source fields. Uh, but basically, th these fields will be um, indexed together with your search index. And this will allow you to um, use match or sort in a much more optimized way uh, instead of scanning the whole data set. If you ever uh, have this use case, you will, you will figure it out. Don't, don't worry about it too much right now. All right, so the deal with Atlas Search that we saw, we have our data, we tokenize it using uh, a Lucene analyzer. Um, we, we can use different analyzers. 
Uh, then we create an index, and then finally we use um, the query API to query that data. And this is the whole magic behind it. And um, this allows it to be like very good and score. This amazing animation is uh, done by my colleague, Karen. Um, look her up. Uh, she's our search expert. But yeah, basically, Atva Search provides you with all these things. Most of them are coming from Lucene. Um, and I can't really say that, but we might also have um, vector storage available soon, if you're interested in that. And you probably are, if you're here. All right, before we start with the second part of the workshop slash tutorial, uh, I can give you this again if you are interested in following the tutorial uh, later. Uh, again, we went through the first part, which is the Atva search part. Now we're going to go through the second part of the workshop, uh, which is the GraphQL part. So together we will build a GraphQL API that exposes the search functionality that we built. All right, let's get started with GraphQL. How many people here have used GraphQL before? All right, that's really good, so I can tell you anything, and if you have questions, ask these two people who used it. But let's start uh, a bit back. How many people have used the REST API? All right, that's good. So I can use this reference. Uh, the REST API usually works the following way. You decide to build a REST API. Let's say that uh, we're building a movies catalog. So we create one, our first endpoint, which allows us to fetch the movies. And uh, then we realize that for this page, we actually don't need everything in this movies document. So we create a movies titles endpoint. Then someone comes and tells us this is not the right way to build a REST API. You can't really uh, build movies titles because this is not a real entity in your system. So you might be very smart and uh, create a query parameter for filtering. And that's, that's fine, that's totally fine. It's a bit non-standard, but you can do it. Uh, and then on the next page, uh, you have the movie details page. So you need the movie itself, a bit more details about it, and you also need the comments, the reviews that people left for this movie. So how do you fetch that data from the backend? You get uh, one request for the movies, another request for the comments. And then you decide that you want to be smart, uh, you haven't heard about parallel requests, so you want to optimize it. You build a movie with comments endpoint. And this is maybe not a great idea, but I mean, I've seen systems where you need to like, send 10 requests to get everything you need for a page. So people build these kind of endpoints. Uh, and at the end of the day, this uh, is how your REST API might look like. And the biggest problem is that actually, usually there is no much communication between the front-end team and the back-end team. So you don't know which endpoint you need, so you'll go and fetch like a weird endpoint <laughs> and then ask them to build something else or go and build something else even though it already exists. And yeah, this is the pain from uh, REST, one of them. And some people argue that GraphQL is the savior, the solution that uh, can fix these problems, and many others that come from REST APIs. Now, GraphQL has its own problem. So everything that I list as benefits, like don't take it um, like as, um, as a one solution to every problem. Just do your research and uh, see if it fits your own, your own product. The difference is that in GraphQL, you have just one single endpoint. By default, maybe slash GraphQL, my API slash GraphQL. And you have a declarative language that you use for building queries. This is how a query um, using the GraphQL query language looks like. So you're saying, I want movies, and I want just the title field from the movies. Nothing else, nothing more. And this is what you get in return, just the data that you requested. So makes sense, right? Why is it not like that in REST? Um, you can also have nested objects. So if you request the title, the IMDB object, specifically the rating from it, the year and the directors, this is what you get back. As simple as that. 
you can have parameters. Uh, you can filter by movie ID, for instance. Um, you can see that we have a type here, which is something that we don't necessarily have with REST. We have a type that is actually a MongoDB-specific field. So our API needs to understand this type. We can use this to query for specifically for the movie that we want. Uh, we can actually query multiple entities. So uh, the powerful thing is that we can get the movie together with its comments with just a single request, if this is how our UI should work. But what exactly is GraphQL? We saw some very magical things happening here. So this is how you use an API. But how do you build it? What's behind it? GraphQL is actually a specification. It's not um, a set library or a technology or like many libraries. It's a specification that you can implement yourself. And uh, GraphQL is actually something that people call um, these two things, the query language, GQL, or GraphQL query language, and the server-side runtime that understands how to execute these queries. So the GraphQL query language uh, basically has queries that allow you to fetch data and mutations that allow you to change data. It also has something called subscribers, saying this just for like consistency, but we are not going to discuss subscribers today. So basically queries get mutations, change data. And uh, if we take a look at one query here, uh, what do we see? So first we have the operation type. Uh, we have an operation query. Then we have the name of the operation. We can call it whatever we want. And then we have the variables. Then every single um, field that we see here uh, is something that, um, that we can get from the API. And these fields should correspond to functions that know how to resolve the data that should be returned when we request these fields. Next to the fields, we have arguments. So every single field can have an argument, not just the top level field there. And our API, our server, should know how to like, read this, parse these arguments, and what to do with them. So this is the query language. What about the runtime? Uh, the runtime, runtime here in this context means the execution environment. So when we uh, run our program, what is the execution environment that can understand uh, a GraphQL query? It's defined by this, by this specification, and you can implement it yourself. And basically, it allows you to execute GraphQL queries. There is one more thing, though. So it's not just the query language and the runtime. There is also a type system. And this is really cool because it's a clearly defined contract between the uh, client and the server, the one who requests and the one who responds. So they, uh, when you request data, uh, if you misspell something or you put the wrong type, uh, you won't get, uh, you will get an error. And uh, this is because you have a clear contract. Uh, the contract contains the available operations, so all the field names, the input parameters, and all the possible responses. And this is how a typical like, web application that uses GraphQL um, might look like. So you have some front-end framework, React, Angular, or whatever, that sends um, queries through a GraphQL client library. This GraphQL client library knows how to convert the query language to an HTTP request. It could be another protocol, but yeah, uh, HTTP is simple and it's, like, universal. Um, this goes to a GraphQL API, and now the GraphQL API can be just a federation point across multiple services. So one GraphQL API can request multiple other services, databases, other APIs, combine that data, and, uh, and pass it back. In the example that we will see, uh, we will have um, an Angular or React like, application, it doesn't really matter, which uses a client library called Apollo. Uh, and it communicates over HTTP with a MongoDB Atlas GraphQL API that we will build now. The GraphQL API exposes data from an Atlas database, a MongoDB database that is hosted in the cloud. Uh, so what is the purpose of this GraphQL API? Why are we building it with MongoDB Atlas? What are the benefits? And the purpose, like the reason, 
is that I have like only like 20, 30 minutes and I don't want to spend all the time building like f resolver functions. It's super easy to build it. It's fully serverless. Um, it has out of the box authentication that we will implement uh, in the next like, demo. And basically it gives you everything out of the box. Uh, it's kind of slow and painful to build a GraphQL API on the server yourself. It's very easy to use it on the front end, but then when you have to sit down and build it, it, it takes some time. There is a lot of boilerplate that you need to write. That's why we will just generate it and use it from, uh, for, for granted. Right. Uh, again, the slide, if anyone wants to follow, uh, you don't have to, of course, but just in case. So we are going to be uh, using, following this section over here. That was GraphQL API, and we will build our own GraphQL API. I'll keep this open because there are a few um, configurations that I don't want to write um, in front of you from scratch. I'll just copy, copy them. OK. So again, MongoDB Atlas, uh, this is our database with Atlas Search. We have something called data services, which encompasses these things. And now I will go to app services, uh, which allows us to build a backend uh, for, for the database and for Atlas Search. Um, I'll close this window. It instructs us how to write our own like, MongoDB Atlas application. Uh, there are a bunch of guides that you can follow. There is also a GraphQL guide, but I'm not going to follow that. I'll just do it uh, myself. All right. Uh, just to make sure that this is connected to the correct cluster, okay, I will go to linked data sources here. I'm not sure it's linked to the correct ser uh, service, so I'll link it myself. So I can select a data source. Oh, maybe I have the wrong, okay. This is the wrong project, so I'll go to my other project. Okay. So what happened here is I have a project with no database and I created a new application and it created a new cluster for me, but I actually need the cluster with my data. Uh, so now I'm in um, the cluster that has data. I'll build my own application. And when I go to next here, and when I go to linked data sources, yeah, we see that it's linked to the Atlas Search Soccer cluster, which is the correct cluster. All right. To enable this GraphQL API, I need to do just two things. First, I need to set up data access rules. So who can access the data and what they can do with it. Um, I'll select the player's collection over here. And I have some presets over here. So I can uh, select deny all access, read all, read and write all. Um, I'll just select read all because I want everyone to be able to see all data about the players. Um, if I wanted, I could start from scratch and define field level permissions so everyone can see just specific fields instead of everything. I could do that, but um, let's keep it simple for the demo. So I'm adding this preset row, and this created a draft for my application, so I need to deploy the changes. Uh, so this is an actual like backend that someone might be using at the moment, so I need to redeploy any changes that they make. And then the second thing is defining a schema. As I mentioned, uh, GraphQL has a strong API contract. So we need a schema, a strongly defined schema with the fields and their types in order to generate this GraphQL API. Again, I need the same collection. Um, I will define my own schema. And uh, here I can actually generate the schema uh, using a sample of the documents. So uh, Atlas will do that for me. But because I want to expose just a specific subset of the documents, I will skip and define my own schema. I'll go to JSON. Um, and here, 
You can see this is a JSON object. Uh, you can write everything from scratch, or I can just go um, to the workshop and copy the data that I need. All right. So you see here we have around like 20 fields um, instead of the 100 fields that I had initially. So I'm going to save this. Review and deploy. And that's everything I need. Uh, now I can just go to the GraphQL tab. Um, you can kind of see it here. This is the GraphQL endpoint that I can just copy and start using in my own application. And we will do that. Uh, and I can also play with the GraphQL API, API that was generated using this uh, graphical editor. So there is a query that was built for me. Uh, if I go and execute it, I should be able to get one player. It's a random player from the database. Uh, if I go back to the tutorial and copy the query that we have here, okay. This is a bit more interesting query. So let's execute this. All right, what do we have here? We have players, so plural. We're going to limit them to five, just five players. We're going to get the players with age lower than 50, uh, 20, so younger than 20. And we're going to sort them by the um, overall. I don't think I need a sort by actually, so let's remove that. And we have some players, I guess. Uh, let's get the overall as well. Yep, we have the overall. Now I can sort by overall descending. This was all generated for me um, by Atlas, by the platform, using the, the schema that I wrote. So it knows that overall is a numeric field, and it generated the sort by overall descending and ascending. All right, so we have Pedro Gonzalez Lopez from Barcelona, overall 81, Bacayosaka with 80, and so on. We have just five results as well. This is the API. This is <laughs> what we needed to build. It was like that simple. All right. So we have the API, actually. Um, and the next thing that we need to do is make, make it work with the Atlas search functionality that we saw earlier. So our end goal with this section is to be able to execute this query, uh, search players. Now, search players is not a collection in the database, so we can't use it right now. So we're going to create a custom resolver. A custom resolver will be a function that executes some custom code, uh, and it understands this input. So we're going to have query, operator, path, everything that we had um, in the Atlas search query. And it returns the data that we need. So how do we do that? We need to create a serverless function. Um, let's go ahead and copy the function. So I can go here to functions right underneath GraphQL, create a new function. I'm going to call this search. We don't need to change anything else, um, but we can have authentication if we want. And write the implementation here. Now, this is some JavaScript code, but it's, it's quite basic. Um, basically, we get the parameters from the um, input, uh, from this argument that we have here. It's an object, so we need to extract them. Uh, then we construct the different uh, pipeline stages. So we have construct search stage, construct limit stage, um, and we don't need project. The API will uh, handle this for us. Finally, we query the collection. So players is our collection. We say players.aggregate pipeline, convert this to array, finally, uh, and return the results. Um, I'm not going to go through the, the whole code. You have the source later if you want to see it. All right, so let's save this function. All 
And now we just need to link the function to the GraphQL API, use it um, as the, like, the endpoint for our custom resolver. So I, go, I went back to GraphQL. Now I need to go to custom resolvers and add a custom resolver. Search players. Uh, the parent type is query because we're, it's going to be a get request. Uh, we need to select the function. Uh, the payload, so the return type, will be um, an existing type list, so an array of some existing type, yeah? Sorry, the function is now what we defined, or is it a default function that search? Uh, it's not default, it's something that I implemented. Uh, but you can get it from here. I, it's universal, kind of. Um, it's not specific to the players. Uh, but yeah, I pasted the code. Yeah. Um, yeah, but good question. Thank you for that. Yeah, so the final thing that we need here, so we have the return type. We need the input type. And the input type is specific. We saw that we have some specific arguments. So we're going to specify a custom type. And uh, I will copy this again. From here, where, where is it? OK, so this is the input type. Um, it's nothing special. It's just like limit is a number, fuzzy max edit is a number, path is a string, stuff like that. I I'll just put my laptop on, do not disturb. Sorry. All right, I'm going to save the draft, uh, review and deploy again. And let's go ahead and try uh, search players. OK. This is the query. Again, we are searching for Chesney using a wildcard operator. Uh, we are searching um, using the path name. And we're going to limit the results to 5. And yeah, we have Srebni and Chesney as results. It's that simple. We can also implement, um, this is one of the exercises in the workshop. So if you go here, the bonus challenge is implementing custom scoring for this function. So if you want to play with it later, um, you, can, you can extend the function to have custom scoring. All right, final, final thing. How do we use this in an actual application? So first, I need some uh, authentication. Uh, by default, this is completely locked down. No one can connect to it. So I need to enable authentication uh, so that people can use it. Uh, and you see that uh, we have a bunch of authentication providers here. Uh, we have anonymous login. We have email password, social login, API keys, JWT, or even you can execute your own custom code. Now, you may have guessed it. I will use anonymous authentication because it's just very um, it's the most simple one, uh, and we have like 10 minutes, I think. Okay, uh, so we enabled anonymous authentication. Now everyone can connect to this API. So what else do we need? Uh, I need to open the actual application. And for this, I'm using um, a web IDE called, um, called Sandbox. So this is my actual application in Code Sandbox. And I will be using it to connect to the API. So we need to do two things. So first, insert the Atlas app ID on line 17 in index.js. At line 17, uh, we have app, uh, app ID. This app ID, I should get it from here. Uh, actually, if I go to the home page, you see this is app ID. So I can just copy it and insert it. It's probably broken. I need also the GraphQL endpoint. So I will go to uh, the GraphQL tab. And I showed you earlier, this is the endpoint. And now I will open sand code sandbox because it didn't install the dependencies properly. That's why it's not uh, working. Come on. I 
it actually works. It's just this preview that's not working, but I added the app ID, the GraphQL endpoint, and now the app is actually connected to uh, the, to the um, GraphQL API. Uh, let's see what else do I have. I have wildcard, uh, because this is the function that I implemented, so I can search for Chesney, and it works again. It's, yeah, um, yeah, that's, I think, it. <laughs> Uh, there is also, again, a bonus challenge if you try this again um, afterwards. Uh, you can implement custom scoring con by connecting your custom scoring function from the previous bonus challenge. Uh, but that's everything I wanted to show you today. Let's wrap this up. Uh, again, this is the link for the workshop. Um, there is no like tracking or whatever. Uh, I will just see how many people clicked on it, so please scan it. <laughs> so I can come again next year. And uh, that's everything I wanted to show you again. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll be here, so talk to me after the session if you have any questions. Or I don't think you're shy, but if you are, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Mira. Um, do we have any questions? Okay. Yeah, I think uh, it's... Just because of the online, yeah. Um, so I've never heard of uh, MongoDB Atlas before, actually. Um, so thank you for presenting that. Um, I assume that all of that Atlas functionality only ever works with the cloud-hosted MongoDB clusters, right? Some of it, yeah. Uh, Atlas search, yeah, for sure. Um, but there are certain functionalities that can work outside of Atlas. Uh, for community edition and like a bigger subset for enterprise edition, which is like a self-hosted cloud uh, MongoDB database. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, if you have like something specific in mind, you can ask me or... Uh, Not really. Okay. <laughs> All right, yeah. thank you. Sure, sure. Uh, great talk, by the way. Um, thank you. So I have a question. When you implemented the custom function, uh, you like specify the database and the collection, right? Uh, does that mean that we can like use all of the databases that we connected and then like have cross database yep. queries? Yes, that's true. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Do you have any other questions? Here. Um, I'll just quickly check online. I haven't mm -hmm. had anyone yet, but let's just check. Okay, um, no questions online. Um, if um, you eventually get to um, come up with any questions, I think, Mary, are you still around, very much yeah, around? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so you can always connect with her outside and um, ask your questions. Um, I hope you had a good time. Um, with her, and yeah, thank you very much. Thank Vera. you so much. <laughs>